Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to another Ken seminar. This semester, as you may know, we are uh, focusing on mechanics and modeling in transportation. And today is our pleasure to welcome Professor Katerina Barbary from the uh, from Belt. So uh, we really appreciate Professor Barbary being with us today. It's 9 p.m. now in the Netherlands. So thank you, Professor, uh, for being with us. Uh, I'm going to give you a short bio of Professor Barbary. Professor Barbary is an associate professor of chemical mechanics of infrastructure materials at the engineering structures department in civil engineering and geosciences faculty at the Delft University of Technology. She earned a doctorate in civil engineering from Delft University of Technology in the Netherlands and a master's degree in environmental protection and sustainable development from Aristotle University of Thessaloniki in, in Greece. Her research focuses on the link between chemorheological properties and mechanical pro performance of clay materials, exploring how these relationships evolve under complex and interacting environmental conditions. Her group integrates advanced physical chemical characterization and modeling, multivariate statistics, chemometrics, and analytical tools. Professor Barbera research extends to exploring the potential of bio-based materials as substitutes for traditional bitumen in pavement construction. It's our pleasure to welcome uh, Professor Barberi. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you. Uh, can, can you hear me well, first of all, on your side there? Can you, can you hear me well? Yes, we can hear you. Super, thank you very much. So uh, thank you very, very much for the invitation to present this um, Kent seminar series. Um, you always have very nice speakers, so I'm happy to be now one of them. Um, so, and also thank you for the very nice introduction. Um, today, I will just cut to the chase. And uh, today, actually, we will be discussing uh, how to design sustainable pavement materials. Uh, my presentation will have kind of three parts, let's say, if I may say. Uh, which follows the motto of our faculty, which is understand, intervene, and improve. So I will focus the biggest part on the understand, so understanding actually the problem, uh, then understanding and really diving into the fundamentals, and then in intervening on how can I use this knowledge to produce something eh? and intervene and, and, and have a, a technology or a material in this case that I will present and improve finally uh, let's say, and contribute to societal uh, challenges that we face nowadays. So, yeah. So, first I would like to give kind of a background on uh, my research, so how it started and how it developed. So, of course, we know that there are different stressors on road infrastructure. Some of them are, are, were already there, huh? but some are becoming uh, more and more uh, severe, let's say, and affect the durability and the performance of road infrastructure. Some examples for is uh, the heavier use. Uh, we know that the traffic loading increases and also uh, the flows, the volumes are also increasing. We do have climate change um, or more extreme weather effects, and we do see the effects of climate change in the road infrastructure, uh, extreme weather events, precipitations, high temperatures in uh, seasons and in areas that it shouldn't be. Um, we do have also, as uh, mainly the, the road authorities actually, or DOTs from your side in US, we do have a lifetime, extended lifetime aspirations. We want our roads to be there for long and even for longer, eh? avoid maintenance because we don't have enough budgets to, to do this. But also at the same time, we want our roads and the road infrastructure to meet these um, sustainability and circularity targets that we have set eh? at national also, but also international uh, level. At the same time, we do have kind of a volatility in oil market prices. 
we did uh, feel, let's say, the effect that the war in Ukraine, for example, had in the oil prices. So there is also uncertainty in this respect. And of course, we do have changes in materials. So the goals actually for my research group is mainly to understand uh, fundamental relationships uh, of multi-physics, multi-scale degradation, predict, uh, we need models, we need tools, we need protocols, even experimental tests to predict or assess what would be the performance of materials in the, in the long term. And we want to use this uh, knowledge, actually. Eh? We are engineers. Uh, understanding all, only is not um, should not be our goal, but our goal should be to have a solution, eh? an engineering solution. And in this case, uh, the objective is to design uh, bitumen-free, eh? bio-based paving binders, moving away from fossil fuels in order eh, to meet the sustainability and circularity targets that we uh, talked about, I mentioned about, and also to develop solutions for extend, extending lifetime and improving in general environmental and circularity performance of road infrastructure. So as you all know, uh, or most of you know, 90% uh, of road networks around the world are paved with bituminous mixtures. And, and I should have said of the paved road networks, eh, there is also an unpaved part of uh, dirt roads, etc. that th there exists. And bitumen is also used, of course, in other industries. Uh, we use it uh, in other applications. We use it for airport and uh, runaways. We use it for ports, in ports. We use it in uh, rail track beds. Uh, roofing applications. And here in the Netherlands, we do also use it. We have dikes. We, you know that we are kind of uh, a bit lower than the um, water level. So we have a lot of dikes and we use it also uh, as covering. Eh? They use asphalt coverings for dike uh, protection. So you can imagine that uh, it is also another important, let's say, aspect and application here in the Netherlands, uh, the use of asphalt for dikes. And of course, uh, we know that bitumen, eh? so the glue actually that keeps all the aggregates together in the road, plays a big role and has a very strong link to structural performance. Eh? This is what I'm trying. I'm showing here. We are starting from crude oil com composition, binder eh? properties, mixture, and then we are going um, towards uh, structural performance. However, uh, in these changes, we talked about changing uh, materials and eh? changing also quality or composition of materials. So actually, we don't know uh, at this moment what is what are the blends that we are using. Or even we do know, but we do add all sorts of uh, additives and modifiers or extenders to make, for example, eh, to use, um, to recycle. Eh? We use, we, we want to have recycled agents. We do add polymers, we add, do add epoxies to improve performance and increase durability. We do add rubber, for example, eh, to make our um, mixtures uh, damp noise uh, better or plastics in terms of the, in the framework of circularity. So there is a lot of, um, let's say, creativity <laughs> in what we add, let's say, in our binder. Of course, though, this affects binder properties. And we do have empirical specifications eh? and attempts, of course, uh, I think in US you are kind of a bit ahead on this, on uh, performance-related specifications. But still, eh, we are not there. And many of the tests that we are currently using, actually, they don't relate to what we see in the field. Of course, all these bitumen additives eh, or asphalt additives, eh, I'm going to use the word bitumen a lot. In, in Europe, we use the word bitumen for asphalt. So uh, there is kind of a terminology issue there, but I hope we, we you can follow along. Um, so bitumen and additives and filler and aggregates. So what is the interaction of all of this? Eh? And especially in light of new technologies, for example, or 
yeah, new technologies or at least implementation of existing technologies eh, like low temperature asphalt, for example. All of this, you can imagine that there are parameters. And if we add also uh, the material environment interactions or the structure environment interactions, then you can imagine that we do have high uncertainty and we see the durability of the roads going down because of all these conditions and the variability actually of what we get going higher. So this actually uh, made me already years back and also not only me, but other researchers in our field to look more on the lower scale, let's say, to try to understand how the link between material that you have, eh, material processing, so, and then chemical composition, and then the link to rheological properties, and finally mechanical performance can be made. So actually what my group is working on is kind to uncover, let's say, the relations between, and, and, and create relationships among the different link uh, scales and link these uh, different properties at the different scale with, of course, the aim to understand how everything works and under environmental uh, conditions. And having this knowledge can help us uh, engineer materials. Huh? And this is the ultimate goal. So now I will focus more on environmental material degradation and I will show you some examples of work that we have been doing. Um, so material degradation due to environment, of course, there is a traffic, eh? but now I'm focusing more as, I, as I'm uh, showing also on environmental degradation. So it can happen um, through many, many, many different mechanisms and processes that are related to oxidative aging, as we know, relates to moisture or water that it, there is um, in a pavement and interacts with materials. UV uh, radiation, even visible light. Eh? There is a recent study showing the visible light affects also uh, pavement uh, and temperature, etc. All of these uh, changes and, and, and influences actually affect chemistry, the chemistry of the material, the rheological properties, and therefore uh, mechanical performance. And this is... Uh, three out of the so many, let's say, uh, distresses that we could see in asphalt pavements, eh, starting from low temperature cracking, fatigue cracking, and raveling. Raveling, especially in the Netherlands, it's a big issue because we do have polish mixtures. So raveling actually is the number one distress and uh, almost 80% of the pavements fail because of raveling. So what we did and we were discussing is, okay, how can we assess now what is this influence of environmental parameters on performance? And specifically, the objective for this project that I'm going to show was raveling. And then we, of course, started looking at bitumen aging. Huh? We do know that oxidative aging creates a material that it becomes that it is more brittle, so uh, it will it is more susceptible to cracking and raveling. So what we did actually was that we made um, here in the campus, two uh, mixtures, one porous asphalt and one uh, stone mastic asphalt. So this is, uh, let's say, the in the left, it's the more porous one. You can already see eh, the porous uh, here. A porous asphalt here is around 25% of voids. And we do have also an SMA with a much lower percent of voids, three to five usually uh, percent. And we laid these test sections. Since then, since October 2014, we have been, let's say, sampling um, uh, these uh, test sections. In the beginning, it was, um, I think, in 0, 3, 6, 9, 12 months, but now we do it every year. And what do we do with this? We take cores. Of course, we test them using um, a mechanical test, eh? so at mixture level. But what I am more uh, interested in and what I'm, I'm doing is actually on uh, extracting the bitumen and testing the bitumen and trying to map what is the uh, degradation uh, of bitumen, of, of the bitumen properties with time. And how do we do it? We usually uh, slice, slice uh, the sample. Uh, we do have three slices. It is very relevant because we do want also to um, investigate uh, 
uh, aging in depth, especially for the porous mixture. And then we test with two, I could say, kind of standard methods at the moment that we use uh, in pavement. And so DSR, rheology, uh, and FTIR to get some information on the chemistry. And of course, we the same binders uh, that we use to make these uh, pavements, we did uh, have them in the lab as well. We did try multiply uh, aging protocols uh, using PAV aging, so some standard protocols, but then playing with different parameters, using uh, different temperatures, pressures, etc. And um, of course, we use actually standard aging protocols as we have according to the European norms, let's say, uh, about RTFO, and PAV for mixtures. And then what we did, we tried to put everything in one uh, nice graph. So what I'm showing now here, it's kind of a chemomechanic relationship. So what we combined here is the co complex shear modulus at 20 degrees and 10 hertz. And uh, then we do have, so this is the rheological information. And then on the x-axis, we do have the combined aging index, which in this case, it's an addition, it's a sum between the sulfoxides and the carbonyl index. So coming from the FTIR data. And as you can see here, uh, if you go on that side, eh, so from the low uh, left end up to the right, then it means more aging. You can find the fresh uh, bitumen on this uh, location here, the RT40, so short term age bitumen somewhere here, and the long term age, so it's a combination of uh, rolling thin, thin oven test and PAV, it's somewhere here in these two uh, positions. So as we were collecting the data, eh, we were doing a similar analysis and we have been plotting those in time. You can see that we start here in 2014, we have here 2015. As we go up, we have 2016, 17, 18, and we do uh, run the tests for until actually we took the last course in uh, beginning of January, right after the holiday. And we are going to populate this uh, graph. And you can see that uh, there is a kind of a uh, dispersion among the different uh, points. I must say that each point, it's a replicate of three, I think here, or of five even. And what actually this shows, this is the top slice, this is the middle slice, and this is the bottom slice of the um, core that we extracted, for example, in 2018. So as you can see, as we started, eh, the variation among in the uh, with depth was less and as we go further the variation becomes more and more with of course highly aged on the top surf uh, part and as you go down to the uh, pavement you have uh, less aging and then we had also what what we concluded from this uh, was first uh, the in-depth variation, of course. Actually, we've confirmed kind of our uh, assumption there and was that actually the protocol that we use at the moment to evaluate aging, which is supposed to give us kind of seven to 10 years, uh, it's not enough even for after four years exposure in the field without even considering traffic loading. Yeah? So then we were thinking, okay, uh, what can we do more? What are we missing? And of course, um, you know that aging or environmental influences doesn't happen one at a time. Eh? And this is what we are testing here. So then we were thinking, OK, let's put together all the aging factors and let's try to uh, derive uh, some um, relations for the different factors eh, with aging and then go towards coupled degradation protocols. So we need to account for different phenomena that happen in the field, actually. And phenomena like this is temperature related, of course, and eh? humidity related. So what can moisture, what effect can it have in the aging, for example? Does it accelerate aging? Does it um, um, hinder aging? Uh, what happens with the drying and wetting cycles? Eh? Your pavement is not always wet. It's not always dry. There are uh, different seasons, eh? you know. What happens with UV? How much does it affect the surface? Because it's very relevant, especially to raveling, uh, etc. And then, of course, how can I accelerate? Eh? But how I can accelerate? So how I can create 
a lab protocol that I should not wait eh, for, I don't know, forever in order to have an answer. And what parameters can help me with this? And this is thickness, eh, how the film, uh, you prepare the film, time, duration, eh, important, uh, and of course, pressure. Pressure is a parameter actually that affects uh, highly moisture, oxygen, diffusion, reaction. So this was also another parameter that we had to look at. And this is what I'm just showing from you, some uh, first results that we had. Now we are a bit ahead with this story and that we try to consider actually long-term aging at dry and wet conditions. So this is what you see here. It's one binder type at fresh conditions, shorter mage conditions, dry conditions, long-term aging, and wet conditions, long-term aging, and similar here for another binder type. And what we can see from these two graphs, and similar, it's, it's here, more aging is going now down the line. So here is the fresh, and as you go down, you go to the uh, most, let's say, severe cases. And what actually we found is, let's say that, yeah, okay, moisture seems promising. Huh? So it seems like a parameter that we can use to accelerate aging. But then the question uh, came, okay, let's put everything together now. How does this relate again to, to field? And what you see here, actually, it's again a chemomechanics relationship. So we do have crossover complex modulus, again, at the same uh, 20 degrees and 10 hertz. And here, only the sulfoxide index. And I will explain why, in this case, it is only the sulfoxide index. And we were trying to derive some parameters let's say, uh, some relationships, I'm sorry. Um, and the this black line represents actually aging in the lab. So from fresh to shorter mates going down to the uh, wet conditions. And this one shows actually how the material changed in the field from 2014 in the top slice only and going down to the different uh, years. So this is year one actually zero, eh, because we just took it after construction, one, two, three, four. And then we were wondering, are we looking at the right indices? Because here, before we use combined index, and there we got a different relationships, then we use sulfoxide index, then we got a different relationship. Maybe if we use carbonyl index, and eh, we tried this, we use a different relationship. So then we went uh, to look a bit deeper. So what are the chemical sensitivity indices to evaluate? Especially for um, binders that are extracted from the field, for example, the sulfoxide index may not be the right one because there is interference, interference next to the FTIR, let's say, signal of the sulfoxides and any remainder filler or uh, mineral that could be in your material. So in this quest, we went a bit deeper uh, working with FTIR spectra and asking ourselves which information shall we use. And looking also towards the future, if we do have other materials that are not bitumen based, then can we use the same indices that we are using, we use at the moment in order to evaluate aging or any type of performance or compatibility or whatever you call it of different bitumens. And then there is more in it. As I said, there is some peak overlapping. Eh? When you're trying to calculate these different peaks, the carbon levels, the sulfoxides, peak overlapping, especially if you have fillers or minerals there. Uh, shifts in the fingerprint area, if we, if you do have, uh, let's say, differences in different uh, instruments, uh, even from there it can start. And some functional groups that may be relevant sometimes have low intensity, so it's not easy to calculate the peaks. Also, for processing the FTIR spectra, there are so many methods uh, that can be used for normalization, baseline correction, spectral decomposition. So what is the best way actually to post-process my, my spectra? And how can I, let's say, avoid these limitations that they come from peak calculations? So then we thought, okay, let's try to use full spectra. So let's not... Um, calculate 
the carbonyl or the sulfoxide indices, the ones that we are familiar with only, but allow, let's say, and use different techniques in order to mine information on what are the chemical uh, functional groups that are of interest. And this is what we did. So the objective was first to classify binders based on source and aging state and to identify the critical chemical information that determine actually this classification eh? that gives us this clustering of the different bitumen types, binder types. So we used uh, different materials uh, from three different sources, so the three different suppliers. They did have four different penetration grades. Penetration grade is the equivalent, uh, let's say, to PG grade that you have in um, US. Um, so we use different penetration grades from different climates. Huh? Uh, some modified binders and different aging methods to create a kind of uh, an array of uh, different binders. So we had fresh, shorter mates, one time PAV, two time PAV, and four time PAV. So 20, uh, 40, and 80 hours of um, aging. And we just did FTIR as the first step. Eh? So we this is a typical uh, FTIR data. You can see the different binders uh, here. And uh, here it is only two binders. Uh, the Q binder and the T binder, the Q is with the pink and the T is with the green. And their, let's say, evolution in uh, or, or change in the spectrum with uh, aging. But then we needed a way, a method, in order to analyze this data. And what we used is actually multivariate discriminant models. These uh, techniques and methods are not uh, new in other fields. They do use it a lot in um, uh, chemistry and uh, with respect especially to pharmaceuticals and stuff for identification of dosages and of different um, um, components, let's say, for drugs and stuff. So it is something that it is already uh, kind of there. Um, principal component analysis is actually a dimensionality reduction technique. So you have usually high dimensional data like this, and you have spectra for different conditions, and you want to transform them into a lower dimensional space and capture, let's say, the most significant variations among the different groups. And then LDA is actually a, also a dimensionality reduction method, but it also classify, can classify. So it maximizes separation, eh, the difference among different classes in one data set. So we are trying to separate actually our data set in different clusters, in different groups based on specific characteristics. What we did, we took it a step further and we said, okay, maybe we can combine um, the two uh, techniques and methods and first reduce our data. So reduce our data space and then apply the linear discriminant analysis on uh, this reduced space to improve actually the grouping, the classification that we are going to, to do. And this is actually how we went uh, for this. On the other hand, you do have, you can see, you do have a spectrum which, uh, which has from 600 to 4,000 wavelengths. So you have actually 3,600 uh, 3, points eh, per, per, um, per spectrum. And then you have all these conditions. And we wanted also to combine some variable selection methods. What do they do? Actually, they try to identify the most relevant features, the relevant features, parts of a data set. And we use two different techniques, moving widow. And I, I'm not going to go into detail. Uh, there is a paper about it, so you could really look at it there. And we used also simulated annealing. So these two techniques actually allows us to find the most significant data sets, parts of the data sets that gives us, uh, will give us 
a better, let's say, uh, model uh, and can th that we can use. So we did this exercise and we use these techniques using the peaks and eh, the peaks that we usually uh, we are familiar with and we use for assessing and evaluating aging. And we also use um, the whole spectra, which with using the different methods, we got it down to 560 spectra variables. And then we tried all these combinations. And we did classification based on the source, based on the type and on the aging state. And here you can see actually the accuracy that we were able to get. The source, you can see that in general, it is the easiest to capture. The type of the bitumen eh, then is its for, uh, penetration for 40, 60 or 700, eh? the different PG grades, let's say, were a bit trickier to capture. And the aging state actually was the trickiest. As you can see, the best uh, method was uh, the best results were given, let's say, when we were combining um, these multivariate statistics with some variable selection methods. But from now on, in the presentation, I'm going to give you um, all the results of the full spectra PCA LDA model following and having two, uh, the moving window and the uh, annealing, simulated annealing uh, variable selection method. So you will be seeing this uh, line, let's say, and this line, which has quite high accuracy. So this is a classification that we did for binder type. So what we did is we actually fed the model. It's an unsupervised technique. We fed the algorithm with all the data that we had right? from the FTR spectrum. And then we asked him to classify. We asked him to make groups based on the information on the FTIR data, so on the information that we get it. And then of course, we had to uh, use, let's say, also some unseen data. So this is not what we are doing now. So we are trying, let's say, to classify unseen data as well that we don't have any idea about. But if you start with this classification, you can see that actually the Q bitumens, they fall very nicely all together here. These are all bitumens that are coming from the T source and the V source is also on that side. So you could actually see that your, the classification is quite uh, successful with a high, let's say, explained uh, variance uh, here. It's uh, 30.6 plus 60 almost. Eh? So it can explain 90% of our data, more or less. And what was more interesting was actually to see what, which were the chemical groups that were important in order to make this classification. And as you can see, the most important groups were the ones related to the aliphatic stretching, which makes sense because it relates to the source of the bitumen, the aliphatic bending, the aromatics, stretching and bending, and the sulfoxides, actually. The sulfoxides also played a role in defining this uh, relation. Similar the, uh, thing we did with the aging states. And as you can see, the fresh to the oven state is here. And we did have classified very nicely uh, the different aging states of our binders. Why it is important for us? Because we could now put some field data there and we will try to mimic and to replicate the field conditions with our protocols and check with this way if actually the conditions that we are using in the lab are uh, representative or quite representative of the field. Of course, it is one way to do it uh, or an extra way to, to, to find out. Uh, we are looking actually in the data itself eh, because they do have to give us a lot of information outside of using multivariate statistics. And here again, we did found the carbonyls and the sulfoxides, uh, the sulfur-related groups actually that they were very important, and the aliphatic bending. So actually, uh, to, classify, to classify aging, which was not a surprise, but you can imagine that the value of these um, techniques when we do have actually unknown uh, binders, eh? binders that we, they don't have, uh, for example, as I said, bitumen as a base uh, material. 
So I will jump to the conclusion. So how do we use it? First of all, as I said, we are trying to use this technique in order to match field with lab data, but also we use this to identify the chemical information that we can feed to, let's say, uh, data-driven uh, models. So we are working also on machine learning techniques, trying to actually to predict rheological properties and mechanical properties based on chemical information. So this type of work uh, with the score plots that we saw earlier, so this type of plots, which gives us what are the important uh, groups to consider, can help us actually uh, feed this model. The specific model that you saw uh, that I saw here, it's based on SARA fractions, but now we are we are expanding uh, the model using also FTIR functional chemical groups. So we do try to get an understanding also using data, but also we use uh, like fundamental thermodynamics and kinetics. So here it is a, a, a modeling a model that we um, um, implemented uh, for studying, let's say, kinetics of moisture transport in bitumen and the different states of moisture that there can exist. Actually, we're seeing these big jumps, let's say, in moisture absorption with time and with higher humidity levels. So we did some modeling and we identified a model that can capture these different uh, ways. And actually we were able to uh, confirm the findings here by performing molecular dynamic simulations when it was clear that uh, water clustering happens at higher um, humidity levels, let's say, when a bitumen is exposed to moisture. But what is important here also is that we were able to see how water or bitumen interacts with water and what are the most important chemical groups, again, that play a role in moisture sensitivity of the materials. And then, as I said, it's about understanding, but then about using this information in order to create uh, in this case, to engineer binders. So the idea here is to understand what are the critical uh, chemical groups and then create molecules that you can combine together to give you a result, uh, which would be a binder actually that can really uh, replace uh, bitumen as well. So here there is one attempt for a circular binder where uh, tall oil pits and uh, waste plastic was uh, mixed together. There is no bitumen at all here. And this is a bituminous binder. So from the looks already, you can see the similarity, and oh, but also the properties. Uh, it, here, I, I just saw the viscosity. It is between the polymer modified bitumen and the 700 bitumen. So it's in a good, let's say, state. Of course, uh, this is an ongoing work. Uh, that is led by an industrial partner, so um, there is more to come. And of course, with understanding and getting more information, uh, testing uh, new possible molecules that can be used, then we can gradually go from a circular, bio eco a circular economy to a circular bioeconomy, trying to incorporate more bio-based, let's say, materials into the chain and to create bio-based uh, binders. This is actually the ambition and objective that uh, we also uh, have uh, in the group, but also in the Netherlands, this is a drive at the moment. And of course, this has an impact. Eh? In Netherlands, uh, maybe these uh, numbers look very small to you because you come from US, but you can imagine that Netherlands is a small country. Eh? It's a 60 million uh, people country. Um, so the production, and it's a very small country as well, so the production of asphalt in the Netherlands is uh, around, let's say, 8 million tons. And there are different decarbonization strategies that we are using, um, that are being used and we also use here in the Netherlands, like the fuel substitution, feedstock, uh, process design, how to make it more energy efficient, recycling, uh, the design of the product, as we said, 
residual energy and CO2 capsule. I'm going to focus on feedstock substitution, which is actually what we are trying to do, going from fossil um, fuel-based materials to bio-based materials. And we did, uh, there was a study actually um, at national level, and there were different scenarios. So they have calculated that replacing 50% of the binder, so not full substitute um, uh, bituminous binders, uh, for the amount of production that we have can lead to a 30% reduction of the CO2 emissions that are related to the production of asphalt in, in the country, which is quite uh, important. And of course, if you start scaling uh, up, uh, uh, what can happen if such materials, let's say, become the norm uh, in Europe or internationally, then you can imagine the benefits that we can achieve uh, using this. Of course, uh, in pavement, in road materials, uh, chemomechanics is somewhere here. Eh? We are at the lower scales, nano micro scale. Of course, we do need validation on mixture scale. We do need even validation, especially for new technologies of the macro scale. And of course, application eh, in the field and monitoring. So the, what I showed is just a small part of a big let's say, uh, synergy that needs to happen, of a large synergy that needs to happen in order to deploy such new technologies. Of course, all of the things that I've um, shown to you, and um, I, I didn't do alone, <laughs> by no means. Uh, this is a team. I have Dr. Jean here in red because he uh, moved uh, forward, let's say. So he he's now working in the road authorities in the Netherlands. Uh, but this is the people that I'm working with um, to make this happen, let's say. And I would like also to acknowledge, uh, of course, the funding uh, institutes. So NWO is the Dutch Research Council, National Research Council. Uh, the Road Authority, Rijkswaterstaat, and CIDR, which is the Conference of European Di Director of Roads, which they provide, of course, the funding for this research to happen. And with this, I would like to thank you. I hope you found it interesting, and I'm looking forward to answer any question that you, questions that you might have. I will stop sharing, I think, would be better, so I can just see... Thank you so much, Professor Werberi. We have uh, time for questions. Yeah, Professor Hutch. Thanks, Katarina. I hope you can hear me. Uh, thanks so much for giving a talk for us. This was really interesting work. And uh, and uh, this is Ramis. Hopefully, you can see me now. <laughs> yeah, I do. I do. Hi, Ramis. Hey, uh, no, I really, uh, I actually, I had maybe a question and a comment for you. Yeah. Uh, sure. Interestingly, we tried a similar approach with some partners we work on a biobinder project with on the, uh, you know, we like to give them the molecular design and see if they could, um, if they could, you know, provide us material that matches that design, because we said this is maybe optimal for us. Um, but they always constantly give us the feedback that it's very, very difficult to engineer from that level. So they prefer we give them a viscosity and they figure out how to deliver us that viscosity. So that was an interesting experience. I, I, it seems you are having more luck with your partners, so maybe uh, I need to work on plastics also. So that was that was really interesting to see for us. Um, actually, my question was about the slide where you had the correlation between uh, G-star and your combined aging index. Yeah. Uh, this one was really interesting to me because the points that were at the surface actually fall above the trend line. The trend line, you could think as a predictive model, basically. Yeah. Uh, that data. And actually, the points that are falling above are basically means the G star is having some increase in stiffness that's not associated with the chemistry of the binder, or at least the chemical indices we're measuring, which are sulfoxides and carbonyls. And I was thinking, okay, maybe this is due to other reactive species, but even things like ozone, you expect those to bond with carbon and with sulfur and, and form those same double bonds. So I was wondering if you had any thought as to what we're missing there that's giving us very high stiffness, but not quite matching the chemistry that we're seeing, because we see the same thing. Yeah, um, yeah, that's a very good question, actually. Um... That's why actually we were start. This is this is something that we see. Let's start from there. Mostly for field age binders, mm -hmm. actually, 
We notice these trends mostly for Philip H binders and not for lab H binders. For lab H binders, things are more consistent, at least uh, for the binders that we have been testing uh, for many years. So one thing that we're thinking was the coupling, eh? coupling of different, let's say, um, uh, how's it called, uh, mechanisms that can have different effects on the chemistry and on the rheology. What I mean, for example, we um, aging will increase the carbonyl index, huh? mm -hmm. and this is what we measure with the FTIR. But if you have moisture also there, sometimes it can make your material softer in terms of rheology. But does moisture increase carbonyl index? Usually not, because we tried also this, at least in the lab. So I think there is a discrepancy there with the conditions that we are considering and the competitive mechanisms. How do they act at the rheological, uh, the rheology level? Another thing that we were thinking is the indices. Are we using the correct index? Maybe there is something more that we need to check. That's why in one graph I had the combined index and the other graph I had the sulfoxides. Actually, we were trying to identify which index could potentially give us a better relation and a better a better picture, actually, of what we see in the in the field. We may need, for example, to account also for indices related to uh, hydroxyl uh, groups. Eh? Mm -hmm. yeah. I don't know. So we are still. So these are our thoughts at the moment. I don't have an answer actually to your question. It's just also more brainstorming from my side. Same for us. Thank you so much. Very welcome. Yes, you too. Um, hello, professors. Thank you so much for uh, this nice presentation. I have a question about the uh, molecular dynamics part. I saw the um, um, my, most of the studies that they focus on uh, more on the physical movement of the mo molecules, but uh, you um, presented your studies uh, also did some of uh, the chemical reactions part. So if I didn't uh, misunderstand, so I'm uh, I'm curious uh, how did you uh, um uh, consider the reactions and uh, uh, chemical reactions and uh, verify this uh, chemical reaction process uh, during the sim simulation. Yeah, thank you for your question. Actually, in this case, uh, there is no chemical reaction here. Eh? It's a water bitumen system, and it's actually an, an uh, how is it called diffusion mainly of uh, water molecules into. Uh, so we we played. I mean, of course, now I just saw the one figure. We had different um, um, contents, let's say, of water in a bitumen model. Eh? Uh, and uh, then we monitored, let's say, the diffusion of those and the clustering effects, actually. And what we showed, for, show, for example, and what we found was that at higher uh, relative humidities, there is a high clustering of the water molecules that can induce a kind of a phase separation already in the material uh, that possibly explains cohesive um, damage in a material in bitumen, for example, but we still need to, um, let's say, do some more work on it. But this is what the first results are showing. So indeed, it is not a chemical. The, the, the chemical reaction is tricky to get, but we, let's say, are, are we, 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 we are going to try now with uh, oxygen uh, diffusion reaction. Thank so you. let's see. Stay tuned. I hope I, I can I can say something more uh, maybe next year. <laughs> yeah. Thank yes, you sir. very much for your question. We have last question. Hi, Katerina. This is Anjali. It's nice to see you virtually. Oh, hi, Anjali. Yeah. <laughs> I was just curious if you can comment. So the aging index, as you showed, like over the horizontal axis, nicely shows that it's getting worse over time. And then, as you mentioned, like the top, middle, and bottom, even like disperses. So my question to you is like, how do you foresee using that aging index and design and also in terms of modeling at a higher scale? Yeah, that's a very good question. Thank you. Actually, what we are aiming to do uh, is first to be able to identify, let's say, sample from the field and identify the aging state of the material. If you know, I mean, 
FTIR, it's a, it's a simple technique. That's why we put also a lot of effort there because it's a simple and fast technique. There are even handheld FTIR devices. Eh? So in principle, what we could, you could do, one could do is let's say point, shoot on the, on the pavement eh? or take one piece of material from a road and find out where it is in terms of stiffness eh? using such a relation, which at the end will help us plan maintenance better or more effectively. Now, when we are going to a multi-scale type of um, um, uh, framework, what I would um, and we are trying to do is actually to use this chemical information in order to predict rheology using uh, a combination of multivariate statistics, other machine learning al algorithms um, and stuff, and then be able from there, eh, from uh, chemistry, to deduct, let's say, properties at rheological level, which then we can use in um, higher scale models, eh, like mixture models, finite element models, etc. We always use rheological parameters to um, represent the properties of your material. So this is um, more or less the direction that we are looking at. Thank you. That's all, Gabi. Yeah, I just wanted to thank you so much for joining us, uh, Katrina. It's it's a pleasure to see you, and that was very informative. So thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you very much. So we just have one very cool, last quick question from David. Uh, how can we apply these insights to enhance the monitoring of asphalt concrete quality across a vast road network? Uh, hmm. that, that's an interesting one, eh? because now we go from really lower scales up to the monitoring, eh? which are we are really in the highway. But as I said, what my ambition would be is to have a very quick way to evaluate the state of the material that we have in the road at any time. And based on this information, that we can plan uh, maintenance uh, activities. So this could uh, be a potential use, let's say, of this. Of course, I think we are a bit, um, yeah, we are not there yet, but I think this would be my ambition. How to really easy without a lot of uh, testing, a lot of, and we do have sensing and stuff sensors, but this could be another way to evaluate what material do I have now in my road, at which aging state it is, do I need to do something about it? So this this would be my. Um, and we are nearing the end of our today's session, uh, Professor Beveri. We thank you so much for uh, taking out this time and for such a nice presentation. Everyone, please join me in thanking Professor Beveri. Thank you very much.